Hello and welcome to The Fairy Folk, the podcast that takes you on a magical tour to discover the myth and the magic of the United Kingdom without leaving the comfort of your own home. Today we're travelling to the North York Moors, a national park situated in North Yorkshire. The Moors are famous for their stunning countryside vistas. Bram Stoker, William Wordsworth and Lewis Carroll are all thought to have written literature inspired by this beautiful area. And so, no doubt, there is also a wonderful array of local folklore for us to discover. In this episode, we will be learning about the magical household spirits known as a hob who once helped out a family in Farndale, and the story of a mysterious man who washed up on the shores of Skinning Grove a long, long time ago. And so, it's time to set off on our first journey of the day to Farndale, right in the centre of the moors, a valley famous for its wild daffodils that bloom brightly across the area during the spring. But it's not just daffodils that the valley is famous for, as Farndale is also known for its hob. A hob is a kind of hairy, wizened household spirit. They're usually friendly and might even help you with your household chores. But that is, of course, if you stay on its good side. And so let's discover the story of the Farndale hob. On the Grey family farm, there lived a hob. He had lived there for generations, watching as the farm passed down from father to son. He had arrived one winter's evening in a blizzard of snow to replace one of the workers who had sadly passed away that very winter. The family farmers were struggling to keep up with their day-to-day chores, especially in the deep snow. And so the hob took pity on them and helped out as best he could. The hob always worked alone, unseen, under the cover of night. And each day the greys would return to find corn thrashed, sheep sheared and cows milked. With the Hobbs' help, the family were able to run their farm successfully for years. Jonathan Gray had always respected the Hob. His father and grandfather before him had taught him from a very young age about the friendly creature, the good he did for the farm, and how lucky they were to have him there. And though Jonathan had never actually seen the Hob, he had seen the empty bowl that had been filled the evening before, with fresh cream for it to enjoy. Jonathan's wife also respected the farm's household spirit and often prepared and left out the cream in the evening, knowing how important the family tradition was to her husband. But then, unexpectedly, Jonathan's wife died. Much of the farm work ground to a halt. Her absence was felt deeply, even by the hob. Time passed, and Jonathan could no longer take the miserable loneliness. And so, eventually, he remarried. And for a while, He was happy, but his new wife began to worry about the farm's finances. Things hadn't been as prosperous as they were in the past. And besides, she had a certain lifestyle that she wished to maintain. Meal portions shrunk, work hours increased, and belts were quite literally tightened. Jonathan wasn't sure about all these changes, but he loved his new wife and respected that they could all do with a few more pennies in their pockets. But then, one evening, his new wife caught him filling a bowl generously with the fresh cream that had been churned in the dairy that very morning. She was angry and insisted that he put it away immediately. Jonathan tried his best to explain that the cream was actually for the hob, the household spirit. It would be wrong for them to break the tradition that had been passed down through generations. But his wife would not listen. They argued until eventually Jonathan grabbed the bowl, placed it outside, and then... He stomped to bed. But his wife was still angry about her husband's strange custom and his refusal to make just one small change. And so she snuck outside, retrieved the bowl, and proceeded to switch out the cream for some semi-skimmed milk. It was better than nothing, and would save more of their precious cream to sell at the market the following day. An eerie kind of silence fell over the farm that night. The next morning, it seemed at first that the hob had gracefully accepted its new diet. But then, one by one, the hob's unseen chores ceased. The sheep were still fluffy with wool, the cows remained unmilked, and the corn was left to rot in the fields. Perhaps the hob had left, thought Jonathan, worried that perhaps he had done something to scare away his family's helper. But the reality was much worse. The butter wouldn't churn, food decayed, animals got sick, and geese and chickens were stolen away by local foxes. It was chaos. The hob had once been the farm's greatest helper, but now it was tearing it apart. Already, it felt like too much to bear. And then, the shrieks came. Unidentified noises, squeals, and screams. Objects moved and flung themselves into the walls with unimaginable force. 
farmhands and dairy maids left in droves, claiming the place was haunted by some kind of poltergeist. No work was done, as Jonathan and his new wife spent each day trying to fight off these unseen forces. Why was this happening to them, thought Jonathan, as he chased the dining chairs around the room. But then, the truth came out. His wife revealed how she had substituted the Hobbs cream for milk that one evening, and that was when it had all seemingly gone downhill. Jonathan sighed. It all made sense now. They had broken a decades-long tradition and disrespected the Hob. This was its revenge. Eventually, the constant torment became too much for the couple to bear, and so they packed up everything that wasn't mouldy, broken or moving of its own accord and proceeded to flee the family farm. The horse and cart pulled out past the neighbouring houses and a man shouted up to Jonathan, shocked to finally see the family fleeing. We're flitting, Jonathan said, as they continued on their way. And as they did, a small voice echoed from within the cart. Aye, it cackled. We're flitting. So, that was the story of the Farndell Hob, based on the versions in the Book of English Folktales by Sybil Marshall and Folktales from the North York Moors by Peter N. Walker. This story is often called I We're Flitting, the words that are spoken by Jonathan and repeated by the Hob as the cart pulls away from the farm, suggesting that the Hob's torment is not so easily run from. An alternative version of the story has the Hob reveal itself to Jonathan at the very end, and in realising that the creature will follow him wherever he goes, Jonathan simply turns the cart around and heads back to the farm, remarking that if the torment must continue, it might as well continue at home. Farndell has a few myths associated with it, perhaps due to its isolation in the deep, narrow valley, and the story that you've just heard is probably one of the most famous from the area, and one of the most famous hob tales too. The hob also has several counterparts from across the world, like the Scandinavian Nise and Tomte, and the Dutch Kibauta, which are all similar household-based spirits and creatures. So, what do you think? Were the greys really tormented by a vengeful household spirit? Or was the Farndell Hob just an old folktale that was passed down through the generations? That's one for you to decide. If you'd like to visit Farndell, I'd suggest doing so between mid-March and mid-April when the daffodils are out in full bloom. You can follow the circular walk that takes you round the valley, past churchyards, fields and farms, just like the one in the story. And you can find a more detailed version of this walk on northyorkmoors.org.uk. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm craving some fish and chips, so how about we head towards the sea? Just over half an hour north of Farndale is the quaint Skinning Grove village. The village was known for its fishing and agriculture before the opening of the Skinning Grove Steelworks in the 1800s. Today, the town is famous for its elaborate 5th of November bonfires, a tradition that has been celebrated there since 1982. But our second story today is set long before the bonfire tradition began, or the steelworks were even built, back when Skinning Grove was a quiet fishing village. The fishermen tugged at the net as the weight of the unseen creature below thrashed and pulled. Could another pesky basking shark have gotten tangled in their net? Or perhaps another short fin? It certainly seemed much stronger and more agile than anything they had captured before. And it took the combined efforts of all of the fishermen aboard to eventually heave the sopping net up and onto the deck. The bundles splashed to the floor and the men stood aside to catch their breaths and get a proper glimpse at what they had just wheeled in. Well, it was no basking shark, that was for sure. Amongst the wriggling bass and cod was what looked like a face, a human face, staring back at them. The men were startled but quickly leapt to work. Netting was tugged away and sea creatures flung aside as the men pulled a quivering man out from amongst the fish, his eyes wide with fear and amazement. Never before had the Skinning Grove fishermen come across something like this. They tried to tell the man that he was okay, that they had saved him from what surely would have been his watery grave, but his eyes still bulged and darted around like the writhing fish beside him. Back on land, the fishermen were joined by many excited villagers, each of them eager to see the man who had come from the sea. They placed him in an old house that had been empty for years, and so that became both the man's refuge and prison. For though this home was now temporarily his, he was kept under careful watch and was not allowed to leave. 
for the villagers were yet to know exactly who, or indeed what, they were dealing with. A young woman from one of the nearby houses came to visit the man in his new dwelling, and though it had been some time since he was pulled from the waves, he still had a look about him that was wild and windswept, as if he had been rescued that very morning. The woman handed over a basket of fish that her family had carefully prepared for him. He grinned wildly and gratefully accepted the gift and at once began to feast upon the raw fish with a hunger that suggested he had not eaten in some time. Soon, many other curious guests came by with a variety of different gifts. Breads, pies and sweetmeats were all offered up to the man, but he shook his head and refused to eat anything except the raw fish that had been gifted to him. He ate without knife or fork, greedily savouring every bite. The villagers had no problem keeping the man well fed, as fishing was their trade, and there was plenty to go around. And though the man seemed appreciative of their generosity, he was unable to speak, except for in strange wails and shrieks, unlike anything one would imagine to come from the throat of a human being. Many of the fair maidens of Skinning Grove would gather at the man's door, marvelling at his humble smile and wild hair that messily grazed his shoulders. His eyes lit up when he saw the women gathering outside, and he gazed longingly back at them through the window pane, just as mesmerized by the women as they were by him. The man from the sea became a popular figure in the community, and though he could not speak, he was always patient and kind, and the villagers were equally fascinated and charmed by him. Eventually, the decision was made for the constant watch on his house to be retired, and the lock on his door removed. He was free. Though he had enjoyed his time amongst the Skinning Grove villagers, the call of the sea was far too strong to resist, and so, one morning, he left his cottage and headed down towards the shore, gliding through the village as if in a trance. A few of the locals noticed the man as he passed by, but not one of them tried to interrupt him, as his eyes were wild and glazed in a way that they dared not interfere with. And finally he reached the shore and screeched blissfully as the cold waves embraced him. He swam gracefully out towards the horizon but paused for just a moment to take a final glimpse at the Skinning Grove shore and the small crowd that had formed on the beach. The villagers, despite everything, had shown themselves to be kind and for that the man was grateful. And so he gave them one last look and a gleaming smile before he turned and dived down back beneath the waves from which he had come. So that was the story of the Skinning Grove Merman. This version was based on John Graves' account in 1808, The History of Cleveland in the North Riding of the County of York, and once again Folk Tales from the North York Moors by Peter N. Walker. I've learned so much about the Moors from Mr. Walker's book, so it makes sense to mention it twice. Not only does it contain versions of both of today's stories, but it also has a handy map of the area within, so you can visually place the location of each story. It seems that the first recorded version of the Skinning Grove Merman is from a Mr. Wells in 1535, who, when retelling the story, was concerned about just how truthful people would find his account, but he swore that the events had happened just as described. Interestingly, there aren't many alternative versions of this story. Mr. Graves' retelling in particular is rather short and sweet, and it definitely feels more like an anecdote that had been passed down to him, rather than a traditional fully formed folktale, so I hope you'll forgive a little artistic license in my own retelling. But essentially, an unknown man is said to have washed up on the Skinning Grove shore, refused to eat anything but raw fish, and could not speak to the locals, and then he disappeared back into the sea, never to be seen again. There actually isn't any proper information on what the man looked like either. I imagined him to be a kind of shipwrecked man, dazed and confused by what was happening to him. But there's no real description of his appearance, and whether he was a merman in the traditional sense, or more human or even fish-like. Perhaps this man was actually a shipwrecked sailor from abroad, unable to communicate properly with the English villagers. In 2012, a man named Jose Salvador Alvarenga supposedly survived 14 months lost at sea on his fishing boat, eating raw fish and other sea creatures to keep him going. So the idea is not completely unheard of. It doesn't, however, explain the ending of the story, where the man desperately escapes the village and returns to the sea. A 1907 article in the Pall Mall Gazette claims that the Skinning Grove merman was actually a tame seal. 
Although it does seem strange that the seas and fishermen were unable to recognize a seal, particularly as they're often spotted along the coast of the North York Moors. Could this be a case of another shape-shifting selkie, like our Scottish friends from Duncansby Head? So, what do you think? Did the Skin and Grove fishermen really capture a merman in their net that day? I'll let you make up your own mind on that one. I love merfolk stories, so I really enjoyed retelling the Skin and Grove tale, particularly because it features a merman, which is a rare sighting amongst many of the United Kingdom's folk tales that mainly feature their female counterparts. If you'd like to search for the merman yourself, then you can by visiting Skin and Grove Village in North Yorkshire. There's even a ceramic depiction of the merman there that was made by some local school children, so don't forget to keep an eye out for that on your travels. If you plan on visiting any of the places that we've mentioned on the podcast so far, or have been lucky enough to have been there already, then don't forget to let us know on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, at the fairy underscore folk. And don't forget that's fairy spelt F-A-E-R-I-E. So where would you like to travel to next? Leave a review and let us know. That's all from the North York Moors, I'm afraid, but I hope you've enjoyed today's journey. Our monthly adventures don't end there, however, as there's an extra special bonus episode on its way to you very soon, featuring a famous Scottish monster that you might just have heard of. So, until then, goodbye! The music featured in today's episode was Galway from Incompetech by Kevin MacLeod. Sound effects were from freesounds.org.